Okay, today I have with me Ben Kirby, the author of Preachers and Sneakers, um, and also the creator of the Instagram account, Preachers and Sneakers, uh, which blew up, uh, was it two years ago? Two years ago, a month ago about. Yeah. Oh, really? Just over two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So you had like a crazy viral moment in the spotlight, or it wasn't really in the spotlight. Tyler Jones was in the spotlight yeah, initially. Yeah. So it felt like me, the spotlight to me. Yeah. Yeah. It was only, it was only me. <laughs> okay. So tell me what that was like for you. Like you're this random dude in, where do you live? I live in Dallas. Right in now. Dallas. You're know, this random dude in Dallas. And then suddenly like, hundreds of thousands of people are looking at you and like talking about you and commenting. Yeah. Uh, that it was a very strange experience because I, we moved up here so I could go to SMU to get my master's in business. And so that was, we moved up here in 2018 and it was March of 2019 where, uh, my wife was out of town on a girl's trip and I had <clears throat> to, to make ends meet, I was DJing on the side. And so I had uh, DJed super late the night before uh, here in Dallas and slept through church. And I had never done this before or anything, but I decided that morning I was going to sit on my couch and watch worship videos on YouTube. <laughs> and so I had, I had uh, an Elevation song stuck in my head. And so I just Googled that song and the video came up and I noticed uh, the leader of the band at the time was wearing some Yeezys that I knew were worth about a thousand bucks, 800 to a thousand bucks. And I, uh, it stirred something within me that I didn't know was in there. And I uh, made a couple videos about it on my personal Instagram account. Just saying like, Hey, did y'all know these shoes are 800 bucks? This is insane. Um, and basically spent the rest of the day looking up other videos like that and noticed that all these, there was all these guys out there wearing shoes that were just outlandishly uh, valuable. And uh, I had a buddy encourage me to start, an account doing just that. And so I took a few days, I thought of the name and then I created the handle and then copied over those original videos. And then within four weeks, I had like a hundred thousand followers. Like there were certain days where I was getting like 20,000 new followers a day. And I had was just on my, I was just on my phone with my thumb doing this, like screenshotting these guys' pictures, looking up the StockX value, putting it next to it, that picture in layout and then posting it and people lost their minds. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was two years ago and it very quickly turned into a whole thing. And, uh, yeah, now we're talking two years later. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I, I think my friend actually, <clears throat> um, she sent me your page, like when you were probably only had like, I want to say 10 or 20,000 followers. So it was uh -huh. relatively early on. Um, and then I remember watching over the next couple of days, I was like, wow, this just hit a hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah. Nuts. Um, it was weird because at every, it, it was one of those kind of things that f people felt compelled to share it with their people. because very quickly I realized everybody had been talking about this in their circles, but there wasn't much to point to, to like make it tangible. And I had no strategy for that. I had no insight into that. I had, I was just an idiot posting, uh, <laughs> like facts about what the, sh what the shoes are worth. Yeah. And uh, people found it interesting. And yeah, there was a, like a couple days there where it seemed like everybody was talking about it and I, uh, I didn't know what to do with that. And yeah, it seemed crazy. What do you mean by everybody? Like in our, like I had several instances where people uh, that knew me, like I had classmates when I was sitting in class after I'd started the account, people started sending me the account because they knew I was into sneakers and I was a Christian. Guy. Oh yeah. And they didn't know that I had done it. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, and so I was getting experiences like that. And so it seemed like a lot of people in my circles were talking about it. And I told the people I was closest to that I had done it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it seemed like a lot of people were talking about it. Was it hard to keep that anonymity like initially? Uh, yeah. Cause you don't, how do you do that? I mean, I just had to figure it out. So like I, I created a Google voice account for these, like the reporters were emailing me asking for phone calls. And I was like, well, I can't give them a personal phone number. Uh, let me figure out how to have an anonymous phone number. And then mm -hmm. I had to, um, you know, you have to sign up for all these platforms and emails and stuff and trying to figure out how to 
do that anonymously isn't the easiest thing in the world, but I figured it out. And also, you know, people cared at, at the very beginning, but very quickly stopped caring to the point where they were like trying to research to find out who I was, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw, <clears throat> um, I was looking through the account recently and you had like this long conversation with some dude who was like, I definitely figured out who you are. <laughs> yeah. That, that happened several times, but this guy basically showed up trying to threaten, like basically, uh, what's the word for not blackmail, but, um, like coerce coerce yeah trying to co coerce me to like pay him money or something because he knew who i was and i was like please tell me who please tell me who i am and it was so off base i was like go ahead go ahead tell everybody man yeah um which was funny <laughs> so what was your uh what, what was your reason for wanting to stay anonymous for so long uh it went in phases at first like it was such a heated thing and some of the most influential pastors in the world are messaging me um so like when people like that are angry they can be pretty dangerous and so uh at first like while my wife and i are processing what's happening we're like well i don't know what's going to happen here i don't know if somebody's going to show up at my house like let's just stay anonymous for the time being uh and we'll figure it out um and so we initially stayed anonymous for that reason. And then several months later, like as it progressed and as I like got more secure about what I was doing, it was more of like a interesting element to the account. Like people didn't, I was able to call, cause this whole stir and people didn't know who I was or, yeah. or where I was or what I was about. <clears throat> so I, that was, I, I, um, stayed anonymous for that. And then, um, after, Like, so it, like that was the biggest piece of it. It was like, it was a cool element to the account. Like it wasn't. And also there's some elements of like me not wanting to have fame myself. Like I don't care. Like this account basically fell into my lap and I didn't want to have some big, like, uh, social media proverbial money grab where I was like, let me just ride this social light, ride this publicity to the top, get, build my platforms and then start selling protein powder or whatever. Yeah. Like I wasn't interested in doing that. Yeah. Um, and so like another part of it was me trying to be slow about everything, like not trying to get so caught up in publicity and stuff and it turned into a drug. Mm -hmm. So, um, but two years in, it finally got to the point where I was like, all right, this is exhausting and uh, hard to manage. And also like writing the book, I didn't feel like I could adequately continue in the conversation if I wasn't fully out there for everybody. So yeah, um, that's ultimately why I decided to do it two years later. Gotcha. Um, so I have a couple of questions about that stuff. So um, first off, one of the questions I wrote down is what were some of the craziest responses specifically from pastors that you got? Um, like I know Chad, didn't Chad Beach message you early on or? He commented um, on, he was like, on their gifts the, or something. Yeah. Yeah. He, before it was big at all, I had, I had posted about him a couple of times and he commented basically saying everything was a gift. Um, and people roasted him for that in the comments. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, that, that kind of started where people started realizing, Oh, this is actually setting some of these guys off. Like this is actually causing a stir for them um i've had i've had really like genuinely good conversations like understanding conversations disagreeing conversations that felt like hey we both understood why i was doing what i was doing versus maybe some of the nuance behind some of their situations which was helpful other guys uh, just wanted to have one-way conversations and just were basically screaming at me over dms um which was disappointing and uh and then others, a lot of them just have never acknowledged it. And I know that they, I know that they know I exist, but a lot of them have just chosen never to acknowledge it. Yeah. Fine. It's interesting that you said you're like, these, these guys are powerful and who knows what they're going to do. And it's like, aren't they supposed to be pastors? <laughs> like, right. What the heck? What, right. what kind but, of culture have we gotten to where that's the case? Yeah. The, uh, but the everyone has their own brand of what a pastor is and isn't some are insecure some some are beat down and like on their last 
like straw with people critiquing them. Like it's, you can catch them at the wrong day. You know, I know for a fact, I posted about one guy on uh, a day where a family member had died that same day. And it's just like the worst possible timing for me and for that person. And so, uh, like, but I'm, it's impossible for me to know everyone's personal situation. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it is disappointing that there would ever be a thought. And I think it was, it was more fear of their crazy followers because people that aren't pastors who are diehard fans of some of these guys are insane and yeah, yeah. Uh, apt to be insane about someone uh, pointing out the price tag of their sneakers. Right. Like that classic Britney Spears video, the, um, what's he say? Like leave Britney alone or something like that. <laughs> you know, uh, that old viral video. He's like, leave. Britney oh alone. yeah. Where he's, he's like crying. crying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, seriously, it's, I mean, it's sad that the pastor celebrity worship is at that level too. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the book some. I, I've been reading it and um, you, you kind of, well, like, so the thing is you, in, in the account, you never really went one way or the other. You were always just like Judah Smith and the Gucci slides or like, you're just kind of saying whatever and you weren't necessarily like saying it's good or bad. You were just doing it. Yeah. Um, the nature of the account is inherently sort of critiquing them simply by the fact of what it is which is showing the price of what they paid for their clothes but and so in the book i didn't ex i didn't know what to expect i was like is he gonna come down on one side or the other or what and you kind of came down hard like you you came out swinging on on some of this um cultural stuff sorry yeah it froze up for a second um i was reading it and i wasn't sure if it'd be the same thing where you're just kind of like describing the issue and not necessarily coming down on one side of it or the other Mm -hmm. But you kind of came down really hard on um, kind of on the pastors, uh, which me personally, I was glad that you did. I was like, this needs to be said. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me, maybe I guess um, if you could summarize in a couple sentences, like how do you feel about that entire situation, the culture, everything? Yeah, I mean, I it, it's funny when people interpret what I do in a whole different, like some people think I'm shaming. Some people think I'm calling out other people think I'm just being satirical or critiquing. Um, it's hard for me to control everybody's interpretation about what I do, but the book was a chance to go deeper into some of those like harder, deeper questions that came up from the account. Not just like, is it okay for a guy to wear $1,200 shoes? Like that's very much the tip of the iceberg. The book was a chance for me to finally dig deep and basically say some of the things that I, uh, believe about this stuff but hopefully like i spent hours trying to be thoughtful in a way that wasn't so biased one way or the other like i wanted to show the people that you know immediately get pissed about this stuff like look there are some situations here that you need to consider so you don't have to be a jerk about this uh from the get-go um but also i didn't want to shy away from the fact that like i think the modern christian church has been obsessed with a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter and has put these guys in unwinnable situations where that they uh, get larger than life and have the in are like unable to uh, be spoken into and in turn erode massive ministries when they screw up. I like, I think we build idols out of people that don't deserve to be idols. Like humans are terrible gods to follow. I think that we're all obsessed with our own images and our own image and that it would do like, I hope leads to people pushing for more authenticity in their own lives and in the lives of their faith leaders. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of what I've been getting from it. Um, and I was surprised you didn't just stay with like the, I was expecting you to just kind of focus on the whole sneakers, clothing, outfits type of thing, but you went into like how they have like political offices, you critique some of their sermon styles and stuff that they talk about. And mm -hmm. um so you kind of just went like full like Rambo, just like <laughs> blasting everywhere. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I have two, like I've had two years of people basically beating my door down about all this stuff and how mm -hmm. it invades all these different areas. And like, yeah, there's a, the political piece because the kind of the worship of Trump was in your face while I was writing the book and also the, the self-help motivation stuff uh, is also a big part of this culture where it's like, big platforms can be built on basically just being motivational speakers. So yeah, yeah, I tried to get in that too and see, like try to be gracious about like, Hey, is there a place where this is, this is 
uh, is helpful for the flourishing of, of our church? Like, are there times where we do just need to like have somebody say like, Hey, you're going to be okay. You can do it instead of, um, you know, maybe the more like conservative, everything is surrounding or like surrounded around scripture, that kind of thing. So what do you think about that then? Like, what's your conclusion now? Uh, I think, I think if you make a habit of watered down preaching without connecting it to the gospel, it's probably a dangerous game to play because Mm -hmm. then you're just a motivational speaker and sure it's like, it feels good, but what eternal significance does that do? Like it very quickly can turn into using God to just fix your problems. Mm -hmm. And that's a tiny God to follow. Right. Exactly. Um, So what's your, like, I guess when a lot of people critique you and they're like, so what's like, why can't a pastor spend his money the way that he wants to? I feel like that's one of the biggest questions you have to field. Um, Like he earned it. Why can't, who are you to tell him how to spend it? What, what's your kind of philosophy or theology around that? Yeah. I mean, I've never really been adamant about who can spend what on what I've just been adamant about asking questions about public figures doing public things, making a public representation of Jesus and encouraging people to consider the message that they send with their clothing. Like very, there's a whole, like if you connect everyone in the comment section to me, then you're going to think I'm a hypocrite telling people how they can spend their money. I've never been the type of person to say, this guy is terrible for wearing these shoes or for having a, a Bentley or having nice cars. All I'm saying is, uh, or not all I'm saying, there's plenty of things I'm saying, but I'm not, I know that I'm not in a position to say who can spend what on what or what's an appropriate amount of money. But I do think that at a macro level, we need to look at the system of being able to get rich off of just being running a church or being a pastor. Um, again, like I've got my MBA, like I believe in making a profit. I want others to make a profit. Like that's what leads us to innovation. That's what like leads us to be able to take care of our families. Um, but when you connect it to service to Christ and his church, it gets messy. And so I just want people to be careful about it. And I don't want to turn, I don't want his church to continue to turn more and more into a marketplace. Mm-hmm. That seems gross because like, yeah. it's two different things. Uh, and sure, like when you grow a church, you grow and reach, you grow and influence, you're able to grow in resources to help others. I think all that's great. I'm nobody to say anything about who can spend their money, but I'm also uh, allowed to ask about whether or not you're running your church as a business, a profit center. And uh, if you're insecure about that, that it might be worth uh, exploring. Um, I don't know why this camera's doing this thing, but uh, like from the beginning, I've never said, Hey, it's always wrong for you to have a thousand dollar pair of shoes. Like who says pastors can't have nice things? Not me. Like pastors can have nice things. You could save, you can work. Like I want pastors to get compensated. Well, like it's a hard freaking job to be a pastor, especially being like a non celebrity pastor with a 30,000 man congregation, 30,000 person congregation. If you take a step back and look at the macro level, a macro look of the church, it does seem like we are more, Satan is in this right now. Yeah. I think that if you're wearing a new designer outfit every single weekend, people are eventually going to start asking about that. And you need to be able to answer like why you're obsessed with designer clothing and putting on the appearance that God's blessing you with designer stuff each weekend. Like if you're surprised that people are asking that question, you're being a little naive Mm -hmm. because people are struggling. And people are like grinding to pay their bills. And if you get up on stage wearing something worth their entire month's paycheck, it's gross. I mean, it's like to a lot of people, you don't, they, they feel excluded. They feel like they'll never be able to do that. They're also being asked to give out of obedience to further God's kingdom. And it sure, like a lot of times looks like you're profiting off of it. Even if you're not, you need to be aware of that, that people are like literally trying to give money in faith to say, God, you called me to give my first 10%. I'm doing that, not so I can get anything out of return, but also would love it if the guy up front didn't make it look like uh, he was banking it. Um, Because it sure does seem like he's living a great life off of the things that I'm trying to sacrifice and give. 
So totally like it, it's not, I, I want everyone to have nice things. Like I would love for the like billions of people starving in the world to have nice things. Like I think all of us that are able to talk over zoom have nice things. And it's impossible for me to say like, Hey, you're wrong for having a, a Gucci bag or like a, or even like a Escalade. Like I can't say that, but I can say that you should be wise about it. And you should have people around you that uh, are able to speak into your life to say, Hey, you, you're in this for the stuff or like you like having these nice things too much. And that's just what I want to encourage for everybody. Yeah. And this is actually where I would actually push back a little stronger. Um, I was just discussing it a couple of days ago with one of my roommates and the way I've thought about it, I just came up with this the other day is I think about it like a, a hierarchy pyramid, like a three tier pyramid where um, like a, a, I'll call it like the judgment pyramid. Um, okay. So you have like at the bottom, you have non-believers. Um, are we supposed to call, are we supposed to judge non-believers? No, of course not. We don't hold them to the same standards as us. So why would we expect them to live remotely like us? So it's like, non-believers, no judgment. Second tier up, you have Christians, just like lay Christians, your everyday normal people. And it's like, yeah, we should call each other like iron sharpens iron. Um, like we, we help each other grow. We, so there's like some judgment, but at the top you have church leaders and James three, I think it's James three, maybe James two says this, um, as well as like, Titus, Timothy, like the Bible's very clear that the top level Christian leaders, they're going to be held to a higher standard and they need to be aware of that. So the fact that they're like surprised that we're like, hey, maybe if you live in a place where there's brokenness and poor people, which is the entire world, yeah. um, maybe you shouldn't, um, you know, flex a different $5,000 outfit every Sunday. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and so what I've been wrestling with, and maybe you have an answer to this is like, so my dad's a pastor, um, phenomenal pastor of like an average, it's like a thousand person church. And, um, he wears like, I don't know, 10 outfits from Kohl's (laughs) and like, that's all he has. And so somewhere between 10 outfits from Kohl's and a $5,000 a week outfit, there's a line. And I'm trying to figure out what exactly that line is and how you would define it. And maybe you have an answer for that, but, um, or, or do you have an, an answer? Or I think the that? only line that I've been able to find is the one where people get distracted from what you're saying. So if for a moment people are like, dang, those shoes are tight or dang, this guy looks good. Dang. Like, you know, that brand I know is expensive. All that distracts from what you're trying to do. And that seems to me like a pretty tangible thing to say, like, got it. Maybe nobody's ever going to say anything to you and maybe it's fine. I'm the type of person that's going to say something because like, I agree with you that the Bible's pretty clear about standards being different for those that choose to be leaders. Not all of you should become leaders. Um, It's a hard job with a high calling. I mean, pretty much the highest stake thing you could be involved with people's eternities. If you believe in eternity, Um, and so of course the standards are going to be higher. Like it's not fair. It's not fair. Maybe that like people have irrational standards that they only communicate to you through email or something like it does. It's not fun. It's not comfy, uh, but it's a reality. And if you care about furthering the name of Jesus and him only, then you shouldn't do anything that's going to distract from that message and, and clothing that's gaudy and clearly expensive distracts from that. And so there's not a number, like it could be a Coles outfit. That's neon yellow that says freaking look at me or whatever, <laughs> like best communicator in the room. If it says that I would say equally, that's equally as distracting yeah. or like anything that points to you as being awesome versus mm. the guy you're pointing to, uh, I think is worth reconsidering. Totally. Yeah. Um, that's a good way to put it. The other thought I had too is like Paul uh, says in the Bible, follow me as I follow Christ. So it's like Paul himself is saying, I believe I'm a good enough example for you to live the way I live and I'm living like Christ. So you can follow me. And I'm like, if, if these pastors live like that, they're saying everyone in their church should follow them and wear $10,000 outfits or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. You know? and is that really the example we want to set? Because 
Yeah, you could see how it messes with the messaging. I mean, it, it goes into how you do church at all, like from the production and the coffee and the people you're seeing on social media with, like it all sends a message. And it all, if you're known as somebody who is, whose profession is to communicate what God is about, then it sure does look like God's about all those things. And that's incorrect. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, the Marine, like I was a Marine in a past life. And we said that too, ductus exemplo, like lead by example. Mm-hmm. Like if you're trying to lead a church and don't think people are going to try to follow your example, again, you're being naive and you need to reconsider the position you're in because I mean, you're the original influencer. Like you have the most influence over people. People are coming to you uh, in a vulnerable state looking for answers and it is up to you to lead them. Mm -hmm. And that should be a very like, uh, that should seem like a life or death type thing for you. Yeah. It's not a game and treating your faith like a game or treating the message like a game is foolhardy to me. Absolutely. And thanks for your service, by the way. I say that yeah, to everybody absolutely. in the service. But I appreciate um, it. yeah, and, and like going back to my pyramid, like the, the Christian level and the church leader level, the way I think about it is like these, like the, the world looks at us and they see that like average Christians are like, yeah, these guys kind of represent what Jesus is like. I can kind of get an impression of what Jesus is like based on these Christians. But the church leaders, These are the people who theoretically, hopefully have studied for years and really know what Jesus is like. The world looks at them and they're like, that's definitely what Jesus is like. So if the impression they're giving is that this is what Jesus is like, he would have worn (laughs) Gucci suits and, you know, Yeezys or fear of gods or whatever. Um, Is that what Jesus is like? You don't have to be a scholar to look at the Bible and think, no, instantly. This is not what Jesus is like. He was homeless. Yeah. So, and you see, and you see how high stakes it is where like when your platform gets to be <clears throat> global, like to your point, people do look to you to say, Hey, this is, this guy, I guess is represents what's what Jesus is about. And if they publicly screw something up, the fallout is like devastating. And I think as normal believers in the middle of your pyramid should care about putting these guys and girls in positions to really screw stuff up. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I know it's a, it's a natural byproduct for people that are more talented and more gifted to have bigger followings and bigger influence. Um, But I think us normal people should, I, I think care about putting people in that position because it puts our faith in a position to be rocked by scandal. And of course, Mm -hmm. all of us are fallible and all of us are fallen um, but add fame and wealth and influence on top of that, it gets, I mean, it gets pretty dangerous. Um, and also like to be realistic, I also don't want to be the type of person that calls people to live poverty gospel or live like one, one equals one Jesus lifestyle, because like, I definitely enjoy my iPhone. I definitely enjoy air conditioning. Like I, yeah. I don't want to be the type of person that's like expecting people to uh, literally live as a homeless person um, because that seems unsustainable as well. So like, I, I want to be the type of person that lives in moderation in between, like not on one extreme or the other, right? but, but also uh, not shy away from things that are clearly glaring. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I was having this conversation in the sauna last night at my gym with a dude, a non-Christian dude. Nice. And we were, we were talking because I was telling him about this interview and I told him a little bit about it. And we were, he was like, yeah, like the Buddha is all about that. The middle way, you know, like, I don't know how familiar <laughs> you are with the Buddha, not, but like, I just know the statue, like what the statue looks like. Well, you know how sometimes the Buddha is skinny and sometimes he's super fat. Um, mm-hmm. That was because he was born into a super wealthy family and then realized that all this wealth was like really bad for the rest of the people in his town. So he went away to a cave according to legend, survived on one grain of rice per day um, and got super skinny. And he's like, this isn't the way either because I'm dying (laughs) in this cave. And so he's like, there has to be a middle way where it's like, I'm not starving and I'm not fat while people in my town are starving, you know? So it's like, yeah. and I think Christians and Jesus obviously I think says some similar things too. Like there's, there's room for moderation, not excess and not necessarily poverty either. Um, but yeah, I think that that's what we should seek after. And it's hard to draw that line, I think. Um, and that's why your definition, I think, is really good. Like if it's distracting people, 
like no one's ever going to be distracted by my dad's like right flannel and baggy jeans and <laughs> like hiking yeah. shoes <laughs> yeah but like so, on the other extreme if he's disgusting and smells terrible nobody's going to listen to him or sure. like um I, I think there is merit to being excellent and mm -hmm. to like having some reverence in in the position you're in or the reverence in like being there to worship god uh it just like it very quickly can turn into materialism or it very quickly can turn into like a an extreme poverty gospel type thing. So yeah, I like fully agree. Like I don't want to, I'm not a Buddhist, but living in the middle <laughs> seems like a good uh, yeah. practice, I think. Yeah. And the other thing too, is like people sometimes make the argument like, yeah, but if you're in LA, you have to dress like the LA people. And I'm like, first off, there's plenty of poor people in LA. A lot um, actually. <laughs> yeah. Second off, um, like, you don't <laughs> for, because like the, I think two of the most influential pastors in America are like Tim Keller yep. who just wears a basic suit every Sunday. Um, and Francis Chan who just wears a t-shirt every time he preaches. <laughs> and so I'm yeah. like, I'm like, no, you don't have, like people are going to be it's more a thin argument. Yeah. A very thin argument. Um, it's just kind of like a, like a excuse for like, I want to dress nice and I want to look yeah. like all these people around there, me. So, I I've, I've heard the, the story about like, you know, these sneakers allowed me to have a conversation point with young guys in the mall. Like, all right. Um, I think God could probably have done like, don't put God in the box to say, I need one thing or the other to have a conversation about Jesus. Like he, he's way more powerful than that. And way more sovereign to say like your appearance is way less important than your willingness to go talk about your faith or yeah. boldness to go, you know, be on mission in whatever current situation you're in right now. Uh, yeah. The LA thing is interesting. I think there's, you know, for whatever reason, there was a set of guys that were able to get into Bieber's circle. And I think there, some element of that might've been appearance and they were able to help him, you know, change his life. I think there's some merit to that, but mm -hmm. I think that's like such a tiny portion. Like I think being charismatic, being a cool dude, like being, approachable and being realistic is way more important than your appearance. Uh, I'm confident those guys could have got in with Bieber without the fear of God. Mm -hmm, exactly. The, the fear of God brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe without the actual fear of God too. <laughs> right. right. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. Um, and so what did you think about like all the other, so besides just the appearance, like the, you wrote about their like, um, going for Congress, going for political offices, the, the white, what's her name? Something white who became Paula Trump's advisor. Paula White became Trump's advisor. Uh, how, what did you think about all that stuff as you were researching it more? Yeah. Uh, through this last, I mean, this last election cycle was exhausting. And I, I don't want to say I hate politics, but politics are uh, exhausting to me and seem like a bunch of fake people on both sides trying to out manipulate the other in yeah. order to keep their position. Yeah. Uh, but it was weird with um, president Trump, how many influential Christians equated him to some type of godlike figure. Yeah. And in turn used their 501 C three church platforms to essentially campaign for him. Mm -hmm. And if you do any research on 501c3 status, they are adamant about you not campaigning for a political candidate. Mm -hmm. And it got real messy when guys would show up to the White House and say, look, I'm not here under, you know, it's not my church that's here. It's just me. It's my, just my personal opinion. Yet you also represent a 30,000 person church. Uh, so like specifically, there's at least three guys here in Dallas that have mega churches that are clearing 50, $100 million in, in donation revenue a year. And all three of those guys uh, were invited to the White House, photo ops with President Trump, talking about how, uh, if you're a Christian, I'm not sure how you could vote for anybody but President Trump. Yeah. And, um, you know, Robert Jeffress of First Baptist Dallas was on Fox News every week talking about how President Trump was basically God's gift to America. Like that, that seems equally as gross. Like these guys probably wear suits every week weekend and they're not wearing Yeezys or anything, but partisan politics, uh, I'm not as much of an expert at, but 
I tried my best to say, look, does God ever care about a political party? Does, uh, did Jesus ever advocate for uh, one candidate over the other where it was like only Christian, like he just didn't deal in those terms. And the two party system makes it to where one, the one party versus the other thinks that God has cho like God's choice is their person. And that's just like, that ends up being idol worship because you end up trying to elevate one dude or girl over lady over the other and trying to basically say, look, followers of Jesus vote for this person. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that seems dangerous to me. Oh, totally. And it gets, and it gets confusing for people where it's like, wait a second, like with Trump specifically, objectively, like I haven't, I haven't said who I voted for, but objectively not really showing that many fruits of the spirit. And so you find like, uh, heavy hitting religious leaders making, doing some real like moral gymnastics to say, well, God doesn't like, we don't care about fruits of the spirit. Like, even though he's pandering to us and saying that, Hey, I'm a Christian, just like you, you should vote for me because I'm the Christian choice. Like he's not displaying much fruit of the spirit. And then you can talk about the other side about abortion and all that kind of stuff, but just playing in those games where it's saying, Hey, Christians must vote for this one person or the other. It gets, it gets messy. And with Trump, people seem to lose their mind about like, it seemed almost like brainwashing where it's just like, I, this person, we have got to get this person in because God has chosen him for just the time as this, like such a time as this, it, it just got weird and gross. And so I just talk about in the book about uh, whether or not partisan politics can ever exist in a church context. I think that it's dangerous to use your platform for political gain. Like, so there's a couple stories in there about people building platforms as either worship leaders or as um, any number of other things and then turning that into a political position. Yeah. Well, now you're influencing people for political type decisions and not uh, for the gospel or their or a kingdom that is of this world, you know? Right. Right. And so it just gets, it gets gross to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm definitely not an expert on that. Like I had plenty of help and guidance in, in terms of like, I talked to a lot smarter people about partisan politics and, mm -hmm. but it just, at least the, Trump era forced me to question a lot of stuff that I thought I believed. And, uh, yeah. you know, when you look at religious leaders that you maybe looked up to growing up in the South, at least like I grew up in Louisiana, um, it just made you question everything. Cause it's like some of these things do not add up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I really appreciated that chapter because that's like exactly what I've been trying to say for the past several years, however long. Um, cause I'm the same way. Like when, whenever they at, tried to put Jesus in the camp, you know, like, for instance, there were several times where they asked him a question and it was like his answer will, will show us if he's on this party or this party, if he's in this camp or this camp. Yeah. And he was always like, well, neither. It's like this. <laughs> yeah. and so, so everyone's, everyone's pissed. <laughs> yeah. And so, or they're all like, whoa, you know? Yeah. And it's like Christians have become really bad at that nuance of like, um, well, there's good things on this side and there's good things on this side and there's bad yeah. things on this side and there's bad things on this side. And yeah. it's, like, I feel like, well, not just Christians, obviously. I feel like most of America or it's a lot of America polarized. has become polarized and very like, um, like, oh no, the, but, but then I do know some people that are also like, well, you can't be a Christian and vote for Trump. So it goes both ways, you know, yeah. and people are like, how could a Christian not vote for Biden? Right. Like Biden's a Catholic and they have their reasons for why the Christian vote was for Biden. And it's like, well, not, I, I honestly think that in the last election, for example, you could be a Christian and vote either way and still be a good convicted moral Christian, you know, yeah. and make a decent decision. Yeah. As long as not you to say that it's an ideal it. decision, right. but neither were, but it like I at least put the work in to try to wrestle with it a little bit. I think mm -hmm. to, it wasn't so easy to say one way or the other, but many people on the internet want to be uh, like you said, polarized. It's like, it's gotta yeah. be one or the other. And it's like, dude, it doesn't, right. And life if, doesn't work that way. Yeah. If you're so blindly in your political camp, I think like you need to re-examine a lot of stuff. That's idol worship. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to get pushback for that chapter because sometimes I make posts on Instagram um, or blog posts and it's like, 
hey, why don't we be balanced? Why don't we stop attacking <laughs> the other side? And people literally blow me up for that. They're like, yeah. why would you say that? Like, um, how can you not say that? Like, or like, what about start coming? Like you're a baby killer. And it's like, yeah, nope. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's and crazy. After, I mean, I'm expecting that, but I've also dealt with two years of people questioning my salvation because of yeah. less, less serious things than that. So that was yeah. funny. <laughs> how can you bring such division to church? It's like, it's Dude, not you. This it's is like, if, it, pastors. if this is what's dividing the church, our uh, church needs a whole overhaul. Like my, if I'm yeah. able to basically divide the entire church by showing uh, what sneakers are worth, then we got much bigger problems. I right. Think. Right. I think that's, um, that's part of what has driven me away from evangelicalism. Um, like, I don't know, you're familiar with like the, the four pillars of evangelicalism, like back uh, in the Puritan times. Um, I, I don't think so. Refresh me. It's called the, I forget his name. Is it the Wesleyan quadrilateral or is it the diff- the other quadrilateral? I can't remember. <laughs> um, I'm rusty in my theology, <laughs> but basically it's like um, the, Bible is the only authority for life. Uh, You have a conversion moment with Christ. You're Mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a motivation toward activism or evangelism, um, Mm -hmm. expanding the kingdom. Those are the four tenets of like, like that's the definition of what an actual evangelical is. And I'm like, well, yes, obviously I agree with those. However, like the word, like as language moves and shifts, like brings a lot extra. Yeah, evangelicalism, like you say you're an evangelical today, and it's like you voted for Trump, you um You're white nationalist. <laughs> yeah, well, or even just like a nationalist, period. Like there's right. a lot of nationalism tied up in it, and Jesus wasn't a national nationalist. Um nationalism in the Bible is only toxic. And so right. and there's um yeah, there's just all these you 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 know, like yeah. you're, you're in the evangelical world. There's all these other associations, which is why um like last, like before quarantine, I started exploring like um, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and like even Catholicism a little bit. And I yeah. was like, there's got to be some alternative to these millionaire pastors who are <laughs> causing more harm than good. And why, why am I still an evangelical? And so I think that even though I still hold to those four tenets, obviously, there's, there's more to the word now where it's easier to just call myself a Christian, not an evangelical type right. of thing. So. Yeah, I think uh, a shift is happening already. I think an even bigger one is coming because I don't, you're not alone in that. I I do the same thing. Like somebody, uh, the girl that did the, this is going to sound self-serving, but the girl that did the article about me in the Washington Post asked me, like, what's your religious affiliation? Like, are you, do you consider yourself an evangelical? And I said, uh, yes, but not like Trump is the chosen one, but I believe in sharing my faith. Like I, uh, saying you're evangelical is well the term evangelical is used as a stat now in the united states for like right you know 90 percent of evangelicals voted for trump or Mm -hmm. whatever i'm not that i'm not in that i'm i believe in sharing my faith and believe that it should be like like those four pillars sounded pretty good to me as well um (laughs) but there's more and more people uh that are either going back to more like kind of ritualistic denominations like lutheran or catholic where you're it's maybe more focused on elements of, of religion that aren't that are, it's more like religion and not like this weird group of ideas that evangelicalism has become where it's Mm -hmm. like super produced very much about patriotism, very much about, you know, what evangelicals are about right now. And I also think there's a, a a large portion of people that are going to move back to doing home church where it's like, look, we don't want to deal with, the structure, the corporation side of it, the uh, all the things that come from running a big organization. Like we're looking for other people that are struggling with their faith, but want to stay in their faith. And we want to focus on the Bible only. Let's do that. Mm-hmm. Why, uh, like, why even deal with all the, the organization side of it? Uh, I think that's going to come, become more and more uh, prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is kind of, like pursuing a tangent now, but like, um, I've thought I've had that same thought too. And it like, there's this weird tension. Um, a, a year or two ago, I wrote an article called, um, why I'm tempted to become a Catholic or something like that. <laughs> and it was because if you think about it, um, we as evangelicals, if you're raised in the evangelical church, you're used to thinking about the, Re- the reformation 
1517 with Martin Luther, Calvin, like you're like, oh, that was the best thing. The Catholic Church was so evil and corrupt and they're selling indulgences and doing all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but was there any harm done uh, from that, like, Reformation? Like, um, for like one thing the Catholic Church used to say in that time was like, if we let the common person read the Bible for themselves, we'll have a hundred new denominations soon. And they were wrong. It turns out there was a million new denominations <laughs> after that because like everyone has their own like micro interpretation of the Bible. And that was one of the benefits of the Catholic church is like, this is how the church every, everywhere in the world understands scripture. And we as a body, a unified universal body wrestle with it, trying to get the best, um, the, the most accurate reading of the scripture. Um, but even more than that, like I ask people like, which is going to be better at feeding hungry people, clothing naked people, um, giving poor people houses? You know, is it going to be this billion person church that's unified all over the world? Or is it going to be 30,000 like little Bible mm -hmm. churches all over the world that are just like doing their own thing and they're supporting two missionaries? <laughs> like, yeah. which is going to be more effective um, from a business standpoint, from any like mathematical standpoint? The, the resources of a billion person universal Catholic church is going to be far more effective at doing those things than like your 1000 person evangelical church will, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So I don't know much about that time back then. I've, I've started looking more into what Martin Luther did because people have brought him up in terms of relation to the account. And that is an interesting time. Oh really? Time. How'd, they, how'd they connect him? Uh, a couple commenters very early on was like, this is like Martin Luther's 99 thesis or whatever. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and I quickly was like, do not, I do not think I'm that. I do not <laughs> think I'm doing uh, even close to equal to what he did, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it caused me to at least look into it. Um, yeah. And I know other people are going back to Catholicism. You know, there's, it's such an interesting thing to discuss because modern church seemed like modern church would be, forever like it seemed like well the churches that are growing the biggest seem to be doing the best like let's just kind of emulate what they do it seems yeah. like the comfiest the best production the best music the best coffee all that kind of stuff but now seeing people really be like whoa is this is any of this good like is mm -hmm. any of is any of this worthwhile uh it's an interesting thing or like people people who have all, like like average people thinking catholicism is boring like catholic services being boring <laughs> yeah uh, now rethinking it and saying like, wait, maybe something was there for me. It's just an interesting. Yeah. Thought. Like, like that week in week out, like habitual, it's not just entertainment, but it's participation in the liturgy. Um, yeah. And I, I appreciate that personally. That's why I've been in liturgical churches for the past like decade, but nice. Um, yeah. And, and it, it also goes back to, is it Amos five where he's like, I hate all your shows and your worship services. Like you're coming in and performing, but you're neglecting the poor and yeah. the, like that's true worship right there. Um, yeah. James Se one says, yeah. Self-righteousness is hardly spoken highly of, or like doing things uh, for show kind of like the whole hypocrites on the corner uh, yeah. set of verses. Right. Yeah. He's very quick to say, talk about, uh, how putting on a show is looked down upon by him. Yeah. And I mean, even when Jesus came, like he talks about like, the, and I think you mentioned this in the book too, like that you have the Pharisees who wear their expensive robes and they do these fancy prayers in the presence of everyone. And everyone was like, Oh, cool. And Jesus was like, basically, I hate that. <laughs> like, Go in you, your closet alone. Yeah. Yeah. Go to your closet alone. But also like, give to the poor. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And by sacrifice, he's referring to like the temple sacrifices, like these fancy shows of like, look, I'm going to slaughter these 12 oxen, you know, like, yeah. look how cool the sacrifice is. And he's like, yeah, but you're not loving the, the, the beggar on your street corner or. Yeah. So it's, it's very hard to me to make an argument from the Bible that permits that sort of extravagance. Um, so I mean, I, yeah, I, pro I probably lean a little bit more toward the, why don't, like, this is not necessary. This is actually like a moral wrong. Like David yeah. Bentley Hart wrote this article call called um, Christ's Rabble. You should definitely take a look at it if you haven't. Christ's um, Rabble? Christ's Rabble by David Bentley Hart. Okay. It's like a 20 minute read, um, some article online. I think it's on the Commonweal magazine, Commonwealth okay. magazine. 
Um, anyway, he's, he makes the argument because he made his own translation of the New Testament um, and he didn't want it to be associated with a certain denomination. He was like, I'm going to just do my own. So he spent two years making his own New Testament translation. Jeez. And by the end of it, he came out and he wrote this article and he said, my conclusion after translating the entire New Testament is money is bad. You know, normally the, the argument is money is neutral. And if you love it too much, it's bad. But he came away saying like money is bad. Like get what you can to survive and get rid of the rest of it because wow. it's inherently bad. And it's super interesting. He's like, Jesus doesn't have any lukewarm instructions. It's never like, yeah, sell, like give away some of your money and live on most of it. And like Jesus is hot or cold. He's black yeah. and white. He's not huh. like, and so I'd recommend that reading that article. It's super interesting. I like that. Yeah. I'll check it out. Christ yeah. Rabble. Yeah. Christ rabble. Um, I like, it. let me see if I had any other questions for you. Okay. Or is there anything that you haven't, we haven't covered that you'd like to um, mention or. I think like I had this revelation this past weekend is that like, this is kind of niche. Uh, the, the subject matter is kind of niche. The Instagram is kind of niche, but the thing I realized that I think I care most about is authenticity. Like it's in the title. Sure. But I think what I want for people from the book and the Instagram and even the comment section is for people to try to be more real in their lives. Like mm. social media so quickly turns into a show so quickly turns into the highlights of your life and then forces you to want to be fake in your normal life. And I think that's part of why I got irritated about all this extra stuff that goes on in our churches is because it, it seems like it's just not real. It's, it's putting on a show for, for any number of reasons. And I think like if you're curating something for appearance or for show, that's being inauthentic. And I don't think that's a very healthy way to live. And so I just want to push people to be more authentic. I want them to be real about their finances. I want them to be real about like, look, yeah, I've got this nice thing and I saved for it. Like you don't have to say that online, but just even in your heart, like if you're insecure about a thing, be real about it. Like, yeah, this is weird that I've got this thousand dollar bag or, you know, uh, maybe don't feel led to post about every nice thing you've ever done. Like every nice vacation or great meal that you have, mm -hmm. because there's people out there that, uh, that causes anxiety and depression and comparison. Um, and, and like, you don't want to be controlled by social media, controlled by the opinions of others, but also if you're a Christian, you should care about serving others and not just flexing uh, because you're on a nice vacation. Like I think Christians don't put much thought into what they post and why they post it. And I want them to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Examine how I was actually kind of convicted by that, by that part of your book too. I was like, Oh crap. Right. I, I mean, I did too. That. Like I had to go back and do that too. Like, yeah. I, as you read in the book, like I'm one of my best friends is in the NBA. And of course, like he, has hooked us up with some of the best, like crazy experiences. And a normal person, me included, wants to show like, hey, look, I'm living this NBA lifestyle, bro. Yeah. Uh, but it's just like, what's the heart? You, you should examine the heart behind that. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes you can cause others to envy. But I hope mm -hmm. that you didn't lose sleep over that. Uh, but I hope it challenged you. <laughs> well, for me, it's, it's not so much like my uh, things I own. Like I literally wear white chucks every day. That's my only shoe I wear. Nice. And black pants. And then usually like a, white t-shirt or something uh -huh. um like and i wrote i wrote a blog post about why i try to wear the same thing every day uh, for a number of reasons but what i do is i travel a lot so i'll post pictures in guatemala nigeria brazil like wherever i am um yeah. and in the back of my mind i'm always thinking like yeah people are gonna think i'm so cool they're gonna wish i would they were me traveling all over the place and so um i read that and i was like well i need to examine my heart behind that too because um I may look, look down on these pastors because they're spending so much money on their clothes, but do I have a, kind of a similar heart of envy me, you know? Yeah. Um, so that I appreciate really, you saying that. Really I mean, that makes me feel start. really good. Like I, if I don't sell any more books, things like that are, are going to make it worth it. Cause I don't know. That's not from me. Like that's, that wasn't my plan for this for the very beginning, but I'm hoping that it, it translates to that for people. So I, I appreciate you telling me that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Cause obviously you're somebody who now has experience with this being on the other side of fame, kind of um, like I was like, 
you and I kind of went viral for very different reasons <laughs> in different ways, but um, yeah, so it was, it was convicting. So I appreciated that. I think, yeah. I think that there's a growing number of people who are not represented in the media, who are not polarized and who are thoughtful Christians who like you and I, who even if we did disagree and I've met some people like this, it's rare, but it's like, yeah, we disagree about LGBTQ issues. We disagree about abortion, but we can still have a conversation. Yeah. And, and I really hope that more people like that start to emerge. I feel like you and I do agree more than we disagree on most things. But. For sure. For sure. But it's just like the polarizing people are the entertaining people. I mean, those are the ones that yeah. stick to their stances and in turn can attract eyeballs. And yeah. And so, they're going to make headlines. And, right. Yeah. So the people that are trying to be rational on both sides are like, well, I don't want to be a part of that clown show, you know? It's yeah. Like, I call them the, I call us the new silent majority because we're not represented in the media. Yeah. It's like, I it's like either that. like this crazy Trump extreme or these crazy liberal extremists or rioters or whatever. And it's like, well, what about the other people who are like my friends and right. a lot of people I talk to who aren't crazy and polarized and yeah. are thoughtful. And so, yeah. Um, well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, it's already been over an hour yeah, yeah. with our dumb technical difficulties for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, is there anything else that we missed any, or uh, any closing words or uh, anything you want to shout out? I think, I mean, I would love for people to pre-order or buy the book. I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but, um, I think it'll be out on Wednesday. Okay, sweet. Um, well then, yeah, you still have time to pre-order the book. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. And hopefully if it's out Wednesday, there should be a giveaway going on where I'm giving away some Jordans and some merch and a couple <laughs> copies of the book. Um, so keep an eye out on that. And yeah, I mean, I would just, if, if people read the book, let me know uh, what you think about it. I hope it serves you in some way. And uh, just know that I tried my best on it. It's going to be imperfect. And I did this whole thing imperfectly, but I hope people can find some value from it. Yeah, it's good, man. It's good. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ben. Um, uh, Preachers and Sneakers, obviously you see it on his screen and my screen, but check out the book, pre-order it. It's worth a read. And uh, yeah, thanks, man. Ethan, thanks for your time, buddy. Good to meet you. You too. I'm going to stop this recording real quick.